You're listening to the Community Pulse Podcast. Welcome your hosts, Mary Thangval, Jason Hand, Sarah Jane Morris, and PJ Haggerty. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our second Community Pulse Live episode. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Mary Thangval. I am joined today by my hosts, SJ Morris, PJ Haggerty, Jason Hand. We also have a special guest host today, Wesley Faulkner. Hi, Wesley. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so these past few weeks have brought us to what we hope will be an inflection point with regard to systemic racism in the United States. And so now we're asking the question, how can we work as a community in DevRel to ensure that we not only address this critical moment, but actively work toward eradicating systemic racism in our industry as a whole. And I will say today's show isn't going to be our typical host-led discussion. Um, we know that we don't have all the answers and we're hoping to have an open and honest conversation with all of you about how we can use our influence and our platforms as DevRel professionals to address these issues. Um, as hosts, we are recognizing our privilege and we're hoping to use it to drive the conversation forward. That being said, we're still learning and we know we might screw it up, so please hold us accountable when we do so. And our goal today, again, is just to make space for this open and honest conversation about how we as DevRel professionals can leverage our influence in the tech industry to make meaningful change toward ending the problem of systemic racism. Um, we want to learn and identify ways that we can be active and effective allies in our day-to-day -day work. And if you want to participate, there's a couple things. Um, you can post in the chat first. When you hopped in today, you were all muted. Um, but if you want to say something out loud, say so in chat and we will unmute you. Um, and SJ will call on you and we can, we can have, have that conversation. Um, we did want to mention while well, we understand that everyone has their own opinions, um, as the host of this podcast, we reserve the right to mute, expel, ban any participants who engage in any hate speech, whether general or specifically against another participant. And please also note that since this specific episode of Community Pulse is officially sponsored by the DevRel Collective, any and all conversations that happen as a part of this episode are subject to our code of conduct there, um, which SJ, if you can drop a link to that in chat, and if you want to click through and read more about that, you can. Um, but with that, I think that's all the housekeeping that we need to do. Um, and we want to just kind of jump in with that overarching topic question that I mentioned a couple times now. We all have influence in the tech industry as a result of our jobs, and how do we use that to make a difference for our Black friends and colleagues? I'll jump in first here. This is a hard, hard conversation, folks. And first of all, thank you for everyone being a part of this. Um, I think kind of, at least for me, my direction, uh, Mary hit it on the head, is that we acknowledge and recognize our, our position of, of, of lots of things. And, and this is one of them. And we know that uh, these are important conversations that have to be had and some things we got to work through and some problems that we need to solve or at least make a good attempt uh, early on to start solving. And uh, I don't know, for me, it's, uh, it's just using situations like this where I know I have the eyes and ears of even the handful of you that are you know, on this call and what can I do to uh, make the situation better for so many, so many of my friends and colleagues and, and you know, even family and stuff that just are going through stuff that they shouldn't have to. So I don't know, for me, it's been, this is a really uh, reflective time these past few weeks. And I feel like my job has, had all kinds of tough conversations and inside the family, tough conversations. So it's been good, but it's also been super hard. And I think we're all looking for like some guidance on, you know, what, what can we do to keep this momentum and, and keep things moving in the right direction. So I don't know if that's really uh, more than anything more than a comment, but something I wanted to start off with, I guess, first and foremost, personally. I just wanted to say that it's a great statement and learning is a big part of it. And finding out how to be an ally can be complicated for everyone's situation, uh, depending on how the work environment is structured. That there are ways to directly confront the system that allows 
kind of the marginalization of people who are under underrepresented in tech. And then there are some things that you can do individually to help be an ally, like um, when a point is brought up to be a sounding board or being the person to present that, that view is really important. Being able to uh, understand how things are built into the system that uh, prevent people from uh, being able to uh, feel like they are comfortable speaking out. So you could do things from saying, hey, I know that person X has uh, some experience with this if you know their history and you know their background. And so you can give them the expertise that may not be uh, presumed by pr helping them, in, by giving a nice intro about their expertise when they present an idea to, to have that be in that, um, uh, in that shroud of like knowledge that may not uh, necessarily be understood. Um, there's also hearing an idea and then reinforcing it saying that person X said that earlier. And I think that is a really a good idea. And I think we should um, think about actually implementing that. So there are ways to have being an ally um, from that perspective without changing the system. But if you recognize that there are problems, there's, there's different ways to step up and that's gonna be different for every person. And, uh, but you might, it might just start with a conversation with the person that you feel may be minimal, minimized in the workplace and figure out what might be a way that you can be a good ally for them. And I, I think you, you bring up an interesting, an interesting idea there, Wesley, too, because I think the, the key word you used there was recognized. And I think the, the first step to, to being an ally is A, recognizing one's own bias, and then B, recognizing one's own lived experience. Like, there's reasons why a lot of people did not understand this was an issue until two, three weeks ago. Uh, it's not a good reason. It, I'd argue it's not even a valid reason. But, uh, you know, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who, who was talking about the idea of Juneteenth. Juneteenth is something that I was taught about and I've known since the first or second grade. And I live in the North. So, I mean, it, like a lot of people are like, oh, it's a very Southern kind of thing. It, it's not. It's just, you know, that was the experience that I had from the teachers that I had. Um, it could be that I missed out. But, you know, there's a lot of people that, that learned about that this week uh, because of an announced event that's going to coincide, your Cohen, not really coincide. It's definitely going to go against the whole concept, but um, like this was an eye opener for them. And that's because they don't have the same lived experience as me, no matter how closely aligned they are with the, you know, my values or my ideas. It's just, you know, there's a matter of education, a matter of recognition. You, the first step you have to, you have to take is recognizing a, you have biases and B there's been things you just haven't learned about. Yeah. Um, I know Rain has something she wants to hop in, but it's almost like when you buy a brand new car and then you start seeing the car on the road, uh, like when you learn something and then you start recognizing it where you go. If you can increase your education on the subject, then you can be better at spotting the things that you've learned about and recognizing it in your own environment. I'll jump in just with the history side of things. Like I wasn't aware of Juneteenth until last week when someone posted in DevRel Collective and said, hey, one way you can make a difference is if someone, you know, if, if your company is willing to make that a company holiday. And it was like Juneteenth, going to Google, what is, what is Juneteenth? Um, one of the ways that I've been learning and educating myself this week is through a podcast series called Seeing White. Um, seen on radio puts it on and we'll by the way drop a lot of links and resources um, on the the website right after this um, but that's just been incredibly eye-opening for me because I think at least my experience with my history that I learned in school did not include a lot of things that are extremely relevant and really built into the foundation of our country Rain, I think. Um, yeah. Yes, I I wanted to get back to what Wesley said um, at the end. Uh, Wesley specifically said uh, to have those conversations uh, with uh, people of color or underrepresented groups, and I I even come 
from an underrepresented group. And I don't actually know how to start that conversation either directly or indirectly to start that conversation after something happens and therefore to reach out. And I feel like that's even too late. Like I, I want to reach out to everyone and be like, I'm with you. And I, that seems impersonal. So I would like to hear more about how I realize, you know, speaking on behalf of an entire person of color group is not fair, but how would you, Wesley, want that conversation to begin? Um, wow, that's that's really hard um, because um, <laughs> right. I, I can totally see someone taking offense to, to, to that conversation. So I can understand how that could be scary. Um, but you might start off by saying, hey, um, because of events, uh, I think we all know what that is, because of what's going on, um, we're, I'm, I'm becoming more aware and I wanna be a better ally and anti-racist. So um, I want to be able there to support you and whatever you, whatever you need in terms of how I can help. Um, so I'm open to that conversation. Uh, I'm not going to put it on you, but I'm just going to be trying to keep an eye open for ways that I can support people. And uh, if you have any ideas off offhand, I would love to hear them. But if not now, then just know in the future that I'm, I'm here to be able to uh, support you in what you need. Um, just so, even if just to have a conversation or even to vent. So um, just let you know that I, I'm going to try to be a safe place for you. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to jump in. There's a question in chat uh, from Quintessence for, well, I don't know why I'm reading for everyone. It's clearly for everyone. Um, for After Rain, uh, while there are some companies that take an actively anti-racist stance a lot, have a more blurry to even unsupportive public facing view. In terms of allyship, where the allies might not be the people with decision making power, how can allies at those companies best support those impacted in those environments? Um, I'll, I'll open it up to the group. Until someone raises his hand, I'm just going to chime, chime in here is that um, the, the biggest strength is if people who feel like they would like to make change find each other and connect with each other and uh, hopefully get together to figure out where they can make changes and make a strategic choice as to where to bring those wants. And uh, if everyone can try to get on the same page as to what the problems are and how they manifest themselves in the company, um, that in itself could give um, a little uh, credence to the argument for, for one, um, making sure that um, you're not separated. Like people try to say like, this is just a one-off or this hasn't happened before, or we're, we're, we're fixing that one problem. And this happens with sexual misconducts and harassment too. Um, and I think that they're, those are highly aligned. And so if ever, everyone's able to share stories, um, everyone's able to get a clear picture of what actually is going on in the company. And two, um, when, uh, when there's, if you're able to refute those things, it allows the company not to gaslight everyone else. Uh, so if someone says, oh, that's that, and they blow off that one question, it's like, is there another question? Then you could be supportive of the person that they just dismissed and just say, hey, that, that is not true. And just keep confronting the, the, the spin with, with reality. And I think they'll eventually learn that, hey, if we say this, they're going to really come at us back with this. So we can't just use that blanket statement anymore. We can't just say that it's not a problem because we know that we'll be called out. So I think being able to have a network where you can reinforce each other and so that you're not, so the company themselves can't take a divide and conquer, conquer strategy. Well, I think the other issue too, and I brought this up a little bit last week on Twitter um, after we saw so many companies with their anti-racist tweets, and I would not call them a stance because they were anti-racist tweets that were then followed by absolutely no follow-up whatsoever. 
uh, whether that be monetary donations to funds or, or movements or whatever, it was a, a super huge opportunity to just say, hey, we do this. And I feel like when there are people who feel very strongly about um, certain aspects or certain uh, things that, and you work at those companies, I think it's, it's almost your duty to say like, hey, you just told the whole world that you are taking into account the, the voices of your people of color, and yet you continue to work with certain organizations. This is so hard to do generically. Certain organizations that are also incarcerating people of color, you can't have it both ways. When are we going to take a stance? Um, you know, specifically, you know, it's great that you changed your, 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 your main branch to main instead of master. That's great. Now stop supporting ICE. Um, I, I feel like I feel like it, it's it's the internal folks' job to call out um, because externally we can do all we want, um, and there's always the vote with your wallet. Like, yeah, I see you. I see that what you're doing is is just posturing, and so I won't use your product. But when people internally are like, listen, either we make real change or we call it a day, and people start voting with their feet that's an opportunity to, and, and I know not everyone has the privilege to actually do that all the time. I've been stuck in jobs because I had to provide for my family and I'm not able to just, you know, be like, yo, I quit. But we have to try to do all we can to say, listen, you made a statement, stand by that statement. I wanted to just add um, a thought um, to peel this back a layer a little bit. I know we're talking a lot about the, the actions we can take at work um, but I think for a lot of us, this has brought up a lot of uh, awareness of our challenges around confrontation in general and how challenging confrontation can be. Um, just speaking for myself, um, and especially I will say as, as a woman, I've definitely been, you know, I guess, um, programmed to be nice, to be polite. Oh, I guess I'll also add as a Canadian as well, that adds a layer to it. Um, but I've been, uh, you know, programmed to be really avoid confrontation. Um, and it takes like serious work for me to get myself in a position where I feel like I can effectively communicate and not just shut down in situations of, of confrontation. So I think there's work to be done just on yourself and literally practicing confrontational, um, um, you know, I don't know what it is, like how, how you can do it most effectively. But, you know, I also encourage us all to be in therapy if you can, if that's a privilege you can afford and discuss this directly with a therapist. Do work on yourself to make yourself ready to, to confront these things and, and communicate effectively in the moment. I think for me, one of the challenges has been just shutting down um, when I'm overwhelmed with, with, you know, emotion or challenge and, um, yeah, I just think that that's just a, a, a layer of work that we can, um, that those of us that that resonates with uh, can, can apply to to a lot of this. And so I've seen some questions pump, uh, pop in here. Carl says he's been wrestling with the question of health, health personally as well. Um, what is the best, most high leverage thing we can do as people in tech? Um, that's a big question. That's a huge question. A lot we can do. I wrote, so I wrote, I wrote a higher I, I, and pay. Higher and pay. Yeah. 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 To that for sure. I did a That's five a point time. plan for like how to start. Um, I don't know how many of you saw that video. Um, but the first thing is realize that there are no simple solutions to this problem. So there's things you can do, but don't think I solved it by rolling out anything. So this is, you have to do iteration. Um, and that is something that has to be built into every single program or else it, it won't work. Um, the second thing that I said to do is to get information and facts. So understand what are real statistics, real impacts. There's plenty of research out there. Find it, learn it, be able to, whenever you decide to speak on this, do it intelligently because you actually know the fact and that it's not just anecdotal information. Um, number three is to find a buddy that you feel comfortable with that can be um, th that that you're able to have these conversations with. They don't have to be a person of color either. Um, but if you can find someone else that um, that you're able to bounce ideas and think through anything that you've learned or were taught that you're trying to unlearn, um, find someone you can be vulnerable and comfortable with, and uh, talk with that person and uh, 
make sure that you get comfortable talking about it. So that way, when you are in a situation where you need to like correct someone that you've already had that practice built up and you know the information of how to confront that. Um, also, uh, one thing is when you do confront someone, you have to realize that shame is a really poor motivator for change. And so if you're there just calling someone out to embarrass them or to just make them feel horrible, realize that most likely that'll, that will entice or like cause a confrontation, but may, may do more harm than good. Um, so find a way to broach that subject without causing shame and making the person feel like crap if you can. Um, and the, the other thing is that um, when you uh, communicate with someone and don't mix up statistics with um, anecdotal information saying, well, blacks aren't educated, so you can't do that. Just say like maybe a majority of people of color don't have some of the educational background that we've been hiring from. Uh, and so we should have a program to deal with that. So instead of like using like a broad brush of saying blacks are like this, just saying, hey, this is a systemic problem that can affect them or disproportionately affect that community. So make sure you don't mix those two and be able to speak clearly instead of generally just actually talk from a statistical point of view. Um, those are some things that I put together in a video. It's very incoherent, incoherent and, but that's a summary of what I said. Yeah, that was awesome. We'll definitely have a link to that in our show notes too. I watched the video. I loved it, Wesley. Taylor, did you have some other thoughts on that? Yeah, what I was gonna add was, um, and it's kind of unique to some of us being remote in not traditional tech cities. And also the uh, like shelter in place pandemic keeping us like at home and not taking vacations as much. And I've been thinking that um, using your vacation time to take off of work and try to do stuff locally. Um, a lot of us have the privilege of, I have unlimited vacation. I've had unlimited vacation for five plus years. Um, use that privilege to then go, whether that is volunteer some time for an organization or um, work on things you want to, projects you want to, to help educate your own like community with, like leverage being able to take off time from work. Um, and then the part about it being remote is a lot of us um, that are in DevRel sometimes are remote and work and live in cities that aren't your major, you know, metroplexes. Uh, and so there's a lot of opportunities to do more local work around this, whether that be with city council, um, you know, local representatives, stuff like that. Um, I think one of the things I've, I think I've always kind of known this, but it's like made it even more obvious. I heard um, yesterday a city council member claimed that like local government is not sexy um, you know, we aren't taught about it in school. And I think there's a lot of educational opportunities, especially as DevRel people. We teach people things. We like educate, we break down problems. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to create content or work with groups to, to break down these things of like, how does city council work? You know, and just these like problems that we could have a lot of impact because they are a different size of a problem than like national. Um, and it can really help people then in your own communities. Yeah, PJ unmuted me and I, the conversation moved on since I raised my hand. <laughs> but going back to some of the things that both SJ and Wesley had said, you know, get therapy and a quote from that I'd picked up from a therapist that I had met with and somebody else's therapist is, is decide every morning which version of you you want to bring today. And I, every morning I go, mm, I try to think like, which, which me am I going to bring today? And I always tuck into how will I, how will I learn today? And the only way you learn, the only time change ever happens in nature in systems and to ourselves is something has to sort of get broken down first. So I'm always trying to be ready to go. What, you know, not self admonishing and guilt and, and, you know, some Catholic beat my, beat myself over the knuckles with a ruler but what was what can I do today that's better than yesterday um, and then how can I 
softly project that model. Like Wesley said, shaming people or making them feel bad or beating people down with cherry pick statistics actually doesn't work, right? It feels good. Like I've got these facts, you dork, but it, nobody responds to that. They recoil back and save themselves. But using that to, to turn to somebody who, who, f you, who sees you as a peer, right? I'm, I'm a, a privileged middle-aged heterosexual white male in the Midwest um, that comes with a certain power, but also comes with people who look to me as a peer and say something ugly, um, moderately ugly or racist. It's my job to say, but then they look at me for like, <laughs> right? Like, I'm not your bro. And I'm not standing on your side of the line. I'm over here with this. Um, but please join me. And here's how to come over and not be so ugly. Maybe you meant to be ugly. Maybe you thought you joined your peer group by sitting around a bar or a fire last night with the rest of the people who all look like me. And you thought you had some camaraderie in that behavior. Um, no, let me welcome you to a group where you'll feel some camaraderie, but you can have some camaraderie around being nice to people because that feels good too. So sometimes everybody just wants to feel like they belong. And for a lot of times people have belonged to a community of ugliness. That's where they felt kinship. So take, take somebody and let them feel welcome in the warmth of treating everybody great rather than smacking them down and remind that of yourself and show that as an example. I, I, I agree, especially based on that idea that, that, that Wesley, the, the negative aspect. And for those of you that followed me on Twitter, I think we all know that I, I am quite snarky and a lot of things that I do can be taken as Oh, Rain, don't shake your head. You know more than anyone. Um, but in, in the same way, like, part of this is, is, you know, like Jordan was saying, he's from the Midwest, and there's a certain way people talk about things. And in, you know, my town has been in the news a lot lately, not in a positive way. Um, and because of that, like, there have been some very angry conversations, and it seemed like a negative aspect was the only way to, to kind of deal with those. And, and it's reactionary. And I've done it and I know it's wrong and I know it's wrong, but it's the immediate reaction when you, you know, something happens and you come out and say, Hey, executive, you know, County executive, why aren't you doing anything? And I like, there's, there's a very fine line between trying to call someone to action or call someone out and being a jerk to them and getting, and I found that, you know, the whole, like, if I, if I just take a second, phrase it a different way, chances are I'll get it. I'll get a response. I'll get some sort of, reaction instead of I'm just going to ignore this person because they're just being an angry jerk and I don't care about angry jerks. Well, and I love the point that Taylor made about like, there's a big part of our job that is education. We can do this. <laughs> we have the skills to do the research and figure things out and educate ourselves and then hopefully turn around and say, cool, here's what I've learned in an empathetic and compassionate way, right? And so I think that's one way that we in DevRel have some unique skills that we can do do that research, ask the questions, figure out what the resources are that we should be reading or, or listening to ourselves, and then also giving that back to the community in a way that isn't, you're all jerks and you're terrible people, but is far more of a, you might not realize that that thing that you just said actually isn't okay or when people come to us directly with questions i know i um the last issue of devra weekly i sent out i put a statement up front about where i was coming from and how i was feeling about it and the way that it was impacting and some of the things that i was learning and i had someone reach back out and they were like i don't understand how some of these things are the things that you're saying like how is it systemic how is it prevalent how is it these things can you give me examples? And I was like, yes, I can. <laughs> but let me do like, I, and I took a couple days to do research and find the right articles to send them to and find the right resources to send them to. And then apologized when I responded with like, sorry, it's taken me a few days, but I wanted to make sure that I could provide you with the right information so that hopefully they won't just dismiss it and not read it, but actually dig into it because it seems like maybe they're open to those resources. And like I said, I think that gives us an opportunity to educate ourselves and then hopefully work 
to help educate people around us as well. Speaking, speaking of educating, we had a, a big question slash statement from Quintessence. Um, there's a lot of discussion about optics. Uh, read an article recently where the author was talking about the optics of intervention. And we'll have the link in our show notes. Uh, one of the examples cited was a white woman witnessing a Muslim trans woman being harassed by what was assumed to be other Muslim boys in Arabic. And we will have the story on the thing, but the, 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 the white woman basically froze. She didn't know how to stand up to an, uh, the, re- the harassment of an underrepresented individual by another underrepresented individual. So Quinn is curious, do we have, does anyone have any thoughts on how do you stand up for each other in tense and difficult to navigate situations like those? There is one thing that I saw uh, as a technique to diffuse a situation um, is to engage the person who is being harassed in a different conversation. Just like, hey, um, I like your shirt. What color is that? And just try to engage them to the point where you kind of shut off and like diminish the reaction to the people, the outside force that's causing the problem. Um, And then you let them know and that they're comfortable with you and that you're safe with them. And that is one way to diffuse a really uncomfortable situation. So if you're like on a bus and then someone's yelling really racist things at another person, you could just like, engage them in a different conversation and kind of like take the power away from that other person. So that's one way of diffusing it. Um, The other is like, depending on your privilege or your safety, you can say like, that's wrong and stand up. Um, So those are some ways to do it. If you're trying to, I would say if you're, if you're worried about your own personal safety is to just basically make the safe bubble for that person and just uh, try to hold them there as long as you can. And, And, hopefully that will de-escalate the situation to the point where maybe you can either walk away or um, they themselves, the people who are the agitators will find it not at all enriching to their lives. Um, so that's, that's my perspective. Uh, I'll let other people chime in. Yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's interesting what, what you're saying, because a lot of it is, is based on what, your privilege is it, what your privilege is. What your privilege is perceived, perceived to be by you and others, and also the level of risk. You know, if it's a matter of getting into a physical altercation potentially, and you are comfortable with that, that then then go for it. If it's not, then then using diffusing techniques are definitely a way to go. You it, it it's kind of a going back to what I was saying earlier about recognizing what you in and of yourself are comfortable and safe doing in an uncomfortable situation. There's no way that situation is going to become comfortable quickly. It's there, There's no magic phrase where you're going to be like, hey, rainbows, and everybody's happy and everybody's running around and every, everybody's cool and you've solved you know, racism and politics and, and everything in the world is, is happy because you saw two people talking on a bus and you fixed it. It's not a fixing thing. Um, so yeah, you kind of have to have a combination. Like you have to have a, 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 for lack of a better term, Batman utility belt of tools to use and know which, you know, maybe it's not time for the bat, you know, get into a fight situation. It's time for the bat, uh, mention the color of the shirt and talk about how well-dressed someone is to diffuse a situation. And at the same time, show you're an ally. It all, it all depends. I wanted to circle back also to what Jordan was saying about like letting someone know that's not okay. Um, I would say the structure, the basic structure of like uh, a social structure um, is the, there's an in group and there's an out group. Like in, if you're in high school and there's like the skater kids, the cool kids, everyone's determining who the in group and out group is for their specific community. And so do a self-reflection about how you're enabling safe passage or being a place of rescue for, for um, uh, people who don't think like you by letting those comments go by, letting those jokes go unchecked. Uh, but if there is a circle from like your Facebook group or whatever, your Twitter circle, or whatever, like your friend group from high school that you're like, well, I just don't want to cause a problem. That's, they say that sometimes just let it go and we move on. Um, understanding that when you provide a safe place for people to participate in your society, they feel like it's okay uh, because they always have a place to go. And as a group everyone if they're on the same page that this will not fly like we can't have this anymore 
then people will start to realize they're part of the out group and it will give them hopefully motivation to be come back into the in group. Um, but generally that's how systemic racism works is that, uh, and why it's important to be an anti-racist because if, you have this in group or and you're against something but you just let it fly then it's showing that it is acceptable everywhere um, and i think that is why you need to kind of do some of that work to, to fight to make sure that um, it, 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 it's not a place where people can feel comfortable saying what they want to say because they think they're in a safe place to say that And I think that uh, Jordan, Jordan made a, a good comment in relation to that your group is a garden. You have to weed it on the regular or everything will die. Yeah. Um, and I think just going quickly back to the confrontation thing, I think like we have to accept that this it won't always be diplomatic. Like I think there exactly, is, exactly. I think there is some power in um, low key and maybe even high key shaming people in, in situations where they're just being completely inappropriate. And we, I'm, I know, like, I'm trying to work on it's that. A, it's a fine, it's a fine line. Yeah. It's a fine line yeah. between saying something in a snarky way to call someone out and shaming somebody. Um, There's and, two elements, sorry to interrupt. There's two no. elements that can help you prevent that shame if you're interested in incorporating them. One is um, you could think of what people say when they get caught. They say like, that wasn't my intention. I'm not racist. And you understand that that's probably the first thing that they're concerned about is their reputation. And so in your approach, if you know that that was going to be the response saying, just say, Hey, I know you're not racist and I know your intention wasn't wrong, but, and then go on and tell them what's going on. And that takes their response in terms of that trigger thing out of their sales. And you, it could help with that conversation. Find any racist comment, Drew Brees, whatever, and then the first thing they say is, well, that wasn't what was in my heart. I'm not a racist. They, uh, like I could play like over and over and over again, all these apologies about these really insensitive statements that people make. Um, but you can, you can preempt that by your approach saying, I know your heart wasn't in that place and I know you're not racist, but the thing that you said was really racist. Um, right. And I'm willing to have a conversation about it if you wanna learn more but realize you probably shouldn't say that again if you don't want to be perceived as a racist. Right. I mean, it, it kind of goes back to what at least all of my teachers used to tell me. That's great, but they're not going to know what you mean on the exam. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter what you meant. What you said is what people are going to take you at. Yes. Um, when and they say take it, you at your word, that's it's, exactly it's what the, people do. It's the impact, not the intention. So folk, mm -hmm. that's, that's what people need to focus on is people like, oh, I didn't mean to run you over with my car. Um, yeah, but you did. <laughs> so you need to kind of like address that right now. There was something that I read over the weekend that was that kind of put that defensiveness into perspective a little bit. Um, and it was this idea that, you know, typically when when someone accuses us of being racist or tells us, hey, you're, you know, you are racist, like we we have a tendency to view that word as like, oh, well, that's, a, you know, a heinous act. It's this terrible thing that someone did intentionally. And I would never, I would never do that. Um, and I mentioned this podcast earlier, but I was listening to the um, Seeing White podcast and they, they actually defined racism instead as social and institutional power plus race prejudice. And it's a system of advantage based on race. And so kind of taking the like, okay, racism isn't necessarily this like heinous intentional action it's pervasive and so mm -hmm. it takes some of that defensiveness of like well but but not me not not me you know me you know i'm not that way it's like well no we're all that way right whether or not it's in intentional the impact is still there like you said wesley yeah right. like try to find a band-aid that matches your skin tone and that can tell you whether or not you live in the privileged society <laughs> well i mean and, and it's funny because you, and I think we all know I'm not, those of you who know me know I'm not a huge Disney fan. One of the best tools that, because I was talking to people, how do you talk to your children about racism? My children are 18, 19, but how do younger people talk to their kids about racism? Watch the movie Zootopia. Through the whole movie, there's a whole issue between wolves and bunnies. There's it wolves, foxes, foxes and bunnies. Um, I am not a biologist. Um, 
And it's, it's interesting because through this whole thing, like there is an undertone of racism mm -hmm. between prey and predator. And it's really interesting to see in which direction of all people Disney goes. Uh, but, you know, don't want to ruin it for you. Watch the movie. It's, it's, it's a great lesson in uh, someone perceiving that they are open and welcoming and they think that they don't, they see the, only the best in everyone of all species. And in reality, they are kind of a closet unknown to themselves. They're, they're an unknown racist. Yeah. They haven't admitted it to themselves yet. Officer Hop says, you're a real articulate individual. <laughs> oh my God, alarm bells going off in my head. I was like, oh wow, I can't believe she just said that. Um, but yeah, great movie, great for kids. I know we have a couple questions. Sarah, you had something you wanted to say. Um, so let me bring you in. I'm clicking yeah. on you. Okay, there we go. Sweet, thanks. Um, yeah, so I wanted to get back to what Taylor and Mary were talking about a few minutes ago because I really liked that point that education is a huge part of what we do in DevRel. Um, and that's true. It's like education and enablement is basically our mission in life in one way or another. Um, and I kind of wanted to connect that to what Carl asked in chat a while back. That's what's, what's the best, most high leverage thing we can do as people in tech. And I love that question. And I, I facetiously, but not really answered higher and pay. We can hire and pay. But I know that like not everyone in DevRel is in a hiring privileged position. Um, but I'm wondering, is there a way that we can take that education and enablement that we do and turn it into a way to improve um, the, the people that are coming into hiring, the people that are getting hired to increase the numbers, I mean? So I, I'm not necessarily talking about like teaching programming to everybody. That's not something all of us are going to do. But maybe this looks like mock interviews or resume reviews or teaching how the process works because the tech process is an incredibly privileged process and it's very insular. So... I just want to see what people thought. I actually, it's funny. I actually had someone ask, or they had someone ask them, uh, what's the best way to get into company X? And they knew that that company was one of those, it's a meritocracy. We have to see your GitHub profile. And uh, so what they were telling people to do, especially people that didn't have a lot of experience, people from underrepresented groups, was start a repository, doesn't really, you know, it could be a FizzBuzz program or something like that. Go in and change one word or one character every day for two months. It gets you all the green that you want on GitHub saying that for two months, you made a contribution every single day. And there are companies that are still hiring based on that. Total cheat, total cheat. But that system is kind of, you know, it's bullshit too. So, um, you can say, well, you can clearly see that it's a private repository. You can't see what's in the repository, but you can see that I've been making contributions steadily every day for two months. Um, and but then the privileged folks that all should be should also be calling out that that's a bullshit. Um, absolutely, absolutely. On top of that hack. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, if you have the privilege to know that this is a way around the system, share the ways that people yeah. get around the system. Yeah, it's more immediate for sure. Um, I know we had a question coming in. Um, is it Jorn or Jorn? Did you want? Oh, she unmuted. Say the J. <laughs> say, With the J? Yeah, say, say the, the J. J. It's Jordan. Jordan. Yes. Yeah. Although everywhere around the world, they would probably pronounce it some way different. But my parents are very boring about it. And they're Finnish and they say every letter in a Finnish name because Finnish are profoundly practical people. Like, why would you have a silent letter? Let's have a sauna. Um, and I, the conversation moved on. I had a comment from earlier. Um, when we use that, first of all, I'd love to, I was thinking just two days ago, the word racist, there's never a good play. I think like, let's never ever even call a person racist because no, nothing good will come of it. If you call yourself, I'm not a racist. It's a degree. It's a spectrum. It's already too late once you've used that word. But the comment I really wanted to make was about, you know, intent. And I didn't mean to in learning. And I'm stealing this from somebody else who stole it from somebody else. But it's saying something hurtful to somebody or having a hurtful comment out there. It's sort of like if I walk up to you and I, I stand on your foot and it's hurting you. I didn't mean to stand on your foot. And if you say, hey, Jordan, you're standing on my foot. It hurts. Get off. I could either say, I'm sorry. I didn't know I was doing that. Thank you for telling me. And we move on. I become a better person. But if I stay there and stand on your foot and then go, why are you being such a big baby? Why are you complaining? And argue with you about how you feel about the thing that I'm doing. Well, that makes me not such a good person. And I think if you apply that analogy to some of these 
ways to, again, educate your peers on maybe that was a bad thing. It's like standing on someone's foot. Hey, that hurt. Didn't know. Thank you. And then we move and learn on. But the thing to not do is go, you just stepped on my foot. You're a foot steppy on person. And then you've immediately, <laughs> no one learned from that experience. It suddenly became, I'm either in this box of this horrible thing that I don't want to wear or I am, and then the argument in their mind becomes about something else, and it becomes a pack of wolf con wolves confrontational thing. Yeah, that's great. And I think identifying those analogies and uh, um, starting to look at your own defensive responses, I think, um, can really help. Yeah. Hey, one other thing I want to touch on. Uh, I'm not sure where we're on, on time, PJ, if you're watching that for us. But um, got 10 minutes left. One of, the, one of the other challenges that I've been mulling over in wrestling with is, um, you know, we're all at home right now. So it's, it's a little bit, I, in my opinion, it's a little bit easier to have tough conversations face to face with my colleagues and my peers and my friends. And um, I don't get to see any of them. And, and I don't, and, and also I'm not, I'm not put, whether I like it or not, I'm not put in situations where I might have to have a conversation, whether I'm ready for it or not. Like I'm here in my house, sheltering from literally everything outside of the world, it feels like. Um, and I wonder, you know, one, once we open up a little bit more and we get back to working from offices and, and mingling with our friends and coworkers, what can we do to keep this conversation going? I think, you know, something we keep, we keep bringing up, we've got some momentum, we, we all um, recognize, you know, that it's in the air, we can keep this going. Uh, and then there's also the other side of the spectrum is I work, I have a privilege of working with a very diverse team, members of my team, literally all over the world. And, and, and not everybody has that, you know, you work for companies that are just in the U S or, or not in the U S or you look, work for companies that are smaller and you have like one, if any black people on your team at all. I mean, there's, there's other challenges that I think some of us are going to see once we start going back to, quote, life is normal or whatever that feels like. Um, but getting back to the things, some of the things that how, how it used to be for work, how do we keep this moving, I guess, is the conversation. And let me, let me also just want add one thing too, because I don't want to hear from Wesley on this, because I, I want to recognize Wesley is not here to educate all of us on what we're supposed to do. This is meant to be a conversation for the rest of us that we can then amplify and share. So uh, I appreciate all of your input, Wesley. Like I'm so happy that you're here as a friend, as a, as a peer, as a colleague, but just want to point that out that we don't want you to feel like, you know, you're supposed to teach us the right and the wrong about this. This is, this is our problem to figure out. So um, anyway, that, that's just, I guess where I wanted to put it out there for anybody else in the group is how can we keep this moving on? Especially if you don't really find yourself around a lot of black people or people of color or any of the communities that are underrepresented. I, I, I know I know you said you didn't want to hear from me, but I, I'm sorry. I have to say something. So I'm gonna I knew call it. This, I knew it. I knew it. I'm, I'm gonna call I this. I saw out that look that. on your face. I was like, Wesley's gonna say something. Absolutely. <laughs> First thing is, um, I am black, but I am not African American. So I, the reason why I'm making that distinction is that my parents are from different countries. And I'm a first generation American. And then my experience is a lot different than the African American experience. And so in terms of learning, I think we all need to learn exactly how to see systematic racism, no matter where you're from or what country you're in. But in terms of the experience of the dominant culture and how they see black people. And the reason why I mentioned uh, that is because the United States exports racism um, and and the media in this country does influence the views of people in other countries too as well as other countries and how they view people who are part of the out group i'll just say that and so education helps with a lot of things um, understanding how uh, you, everyone is influenced by that the media and the the information we're getting and how we should feel about people is extremely something is extremely important to be able to identify and to call out and to see. Um, I will not ever be in a place where um, I fully understand the African American experience, but I am trying to learn all the time. And when I hear things about Black Wall Street and how this country has really oppressed the population and the history of that and that legacy of pain, 
I'm just trying to keep educated. And I, as, a, as like I said, as a person who's black, but not African American, there are a lot of things that I have to deal with and contend with that is similar, but there are also things that I can learn and I'm still learning and making sure that's part of the process, but I'll turn it over to whoever wants to speak now. I think, I think Rain has something to say and I'm trying. Yep. There you go. Yeah, I, I got you. Um, so Wesley, something you said is America exports racism. And I, I want to quantify where this uh, argument, but not really is coming from. Um, I'm an American. I grew up in America for 30 mumble years. I'm in the Netherlands now. I've lived here for nine years. Um, there is there is very much racism here and it didn't come from America. It came from its own cultural history. Um, the Dutch had slaves, the Dutch sold slaves to America. The Dutch were ones that brought slaves to America among other cultures as well. Um, the Dutch don't think they're racist um, anymore and they very much are. Um, our king literally rode in a golden this is why I sometimes don't speak up. I get so angry I can't talk. Uh, the king literally was in a golden carriage that portrayed slavery in a uh, positive light on the side of the carriage. And, and a lot of Dutch don't understand why that's a problem because it's a historical moment um, that is, and then and then we have Zorta Pete's, and then and then we have uh, we have cops. Cops here do not carry guns, uh, but we have police who treat someone who does not look like them, and not necessarily from Africa. People of color come from so many different countries. Um, they they treat them poorly worse than they would treat someone who looked like them. And, and, and I've, I literally have had Dutch people who look like me. And I just want to point out, I'm not 100% white. I'm a quarter Japanese. I've grown up with a lot of Japanese culture. I am very much used to people finding that out and then saying incredibly racist statements to me that I then have to respond to. But I'm saying that because I'm not used to, I, I am used to people treating me as if I am one of them and saying things that I then slap them with. And I, and I want to respond with violence often. And that is not necessarily the healthiest response. Um, but my point is I, I literally today at lunch had a conversation with a Dutch man who said, why are we having, um, why are we doing protests? This is an American thing. And I had, and I had to, I, I had to have those facts and he didn't want to listen. He just wanted to be right. And that's, I, I feel like that is so often what we're fighting is we want people to like, we're trying to change the brains of people who just want to be right. I think uh, I'm not going to call them out by name because I don't know if that's okay, but they said one of the most well-known words is apartheid. Um, and that is one of the, one of the things that really illustrates the point. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think yeah. it's it's interesting, Rain, because you brought up the the historical context, and and it, I know in the U.S., like you know, perfect example of exporting racism, or even the concepts of racism. You know, those of us who are a certain age remember a great show called The Dukes of Hazard, about these good old boys who were ne they were never meaning no harm, but they drove in a car called the General Lee with the Confederate flag on top of it. And I did not realize as I walked into my third grade class that that is a huge racist flag. Mm -hmm. Until a friend of mine pointed out, he's just like, dude, what the hell? And I'm like, what? It's, they, they don't mean no harm. Yeah. And, but it, it's, it's, to me, it's one of the perfect examples because people who are of a certain age outside of the US know that show is just wacky, rebellious kids running, they ran moonshine. 
um, which was legal. And that car was orange, so that in itself was offensive. So, yes, yes. That, it was a, it was an ugly car. We'll get mm-hmm. yes, uh, like it, the the show. Like if you looked at it today, it is ridiculously like racist. It is sexist. It is horrible. Um, but they That's where the of, term Daisy Dukes comes from. That yeah, show. It, like, but the the irony is like they actually had like an episode where like here's our black friend. And I think that that's like the, the amazing thing, like the US tries to do the least amount. Um, Cause when we talk about exporting racism, it's not just as simple of like, it's not just saying we have this attitude towards race in this country. It's saying like, we make movies with white people in them that shouldn't have white people in them. Or there's no reason why all the actors have to be white. We make these television programs that have no reason to have an all white class or the only cast member who's black is like always so sassy. Um, like it's, it's something our media is projecting. This isn't just like an issue. And I think this is what we mean when we say systemic. This is just an issue with the police in Minneapolis or the police in the United States. It's an issue that pervades every single thing the United States does as an entity. And that is, includes its influence over every other country. And for us, like you would think it'd be easier to get rid of those Confederate monuments, those Confederate flags and things. I can't imagine, Rain, where you are, you have an extra 1200 years of written history underscoring the issue of slavery and racism. We have 200 years that we haven't even really done that well and we still can't get rid of it. So on balance, it's, you know, it's definitely not just a U.S. issue. It's definitely uh, something that, that we need to look at. It's definitely not something that we can solve in, in a one hour episode of community pulse. Um, which is unfortunately coming to an end. Uh, I don't know, Mary, do you want to wrap it up? Do you want me to wrap it up or? I can wrap it up. Um, any last very brief comments? I, I got, I, yeah, I, just, oh, go ahead. I'll go, I'll go after you, Jason. Okay. Well, I just wanted to kind of reiterate some of the, some of the points I wrote down that I thought were uh, worth bringing up again as we, as we say goodbye, because I don't want this to feel like this was like a one time only conversation or, you know, this is, this is, this is for the rest of our lives type of thing where we're always making things better. Hopefully we'll make the, the situation we're fighting for right now better soon, real soon. And then we can move on to other things. I've never felt until more recently, like some sort of social just justice warrior, but like, I think in a lot of us, something has been awoken and we recognize our, our, our place and, and the things that we can do to make a difference, whatever those might be. And we also know that within this, this um, we'll just say slice of the industry that we're in, you know, like within tech, it has a lot of problems. And we talk about them all the time and we get in the middle of them and try to find solutions for a lot of them. And here we are again, trying to find, you know, ways that we can use our strengths, our superpowers to actually make a, a, a difference. And I feel like, you know, we're all pretty good at understanding people. We're connectors. We're, we're you know, we're empathetic. Um, we, or at least we, we attempt to get better and learn different ways to improve all these things as skills, as things that we use in our profession. Uh, you know, we're, we're experts at hugs and high fives and things that we're all lacking in right now that I think, you know, it's just it also plays, plays a big role in this. We, we're seen as role models, whether we realize it, whether we like it or not, people are watching what we're doing. And if we're not doing anything, that's still doing something. Um, and I don't know, like one of the things I love about uh, working at Microsoft, working for a big company is I'm exposed to so much but I'm also exposed to a lot of like bad things that forces me into, into situations I got to learn, I got to improve, which is honestly what I crave. Like I need that. And I, and that's why I ended up where, you know, in, I think this job and, and, and doing what I'm doing, but um, you know, changing the hearts and minds of people has just been something that I think we all feel is a, is a core skill of ours, but we've got a lot of work to do and it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter like your situation, um, it doesn't matter if you're like me and also sounds like SJ2, like we avoid conflict, like I, I, I turn inward and I have been fighting myself to not just retreat inside and not speak up. And on, on one side, I've got the voice in my head saying, don't be another white dude taking up space and putting your opinions out there, give space to others and amplify their voice. 
But then on the other hand, I'm like, you know what, but this isn't my voice and people want to hear, you know, may want to hear my voice or you know, if they don't hear my voice, they may think I don't have a voice or, you know, so there's just like this constant battle of doing the right thing versus how you feel all the time. And man, I, you know, I don't know, I'm starting to ramble now and get a little shaky with all these, just the emotions that are coming through. But I wanted to say thank you, everybody on, on, on the call. Um, I hope we can continue, you know, having calls like this having open and honest discussions about just the realities of the world and the things that aren't right and how we can change them. And um, anyway, I'll, I'll hand it over to Mary. You can take us from here, but thank you so much for- Wait, for, no, you're handing it over to Wesley who said he'd go after you. Right, 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 Wesley. This is gonna be really quick. Um, I just wanna say why everyone's attention and focus is on, on this subject. Realize that this is something that needs to go for you have to be in for the long haul um, i'm gonna butcher this but malcolm x had a statement saying if you stick a nine inch knife in my back and pull out three inches that's not progress if you pull the knife out all the way that's not progress if you heal the wound that's progress so i just wanted to leave it at that that's a great quote thanks Wesley. it is Thanks so much for joining today, everyone. Um, we're going to have a recording up, hopefully by the end of the week. But in the meantime, today, I'll go ahead and publish the website. It won't have the recording up, but we'll at least have the resources there. Um, and we'll post that online so that folks can find those and access them sooner rather than later. And then keep an eye out for when the, the episode is live officially. Um, but again, thanks for joining us. Feel free to reach out to us at any time. We're on Twitter community underscore pulse. You can reach out to all of us individually, Deverell Slack, wherever you like. So thanks everyone. Have thanks everybody. a good day. You've been listening to the Community Pulse. Find out more at communitypulse.io, on Twitter at community underscore pulse, or anywhere you get your favorite podcasts.